so I'm, I'm very actually honored to, uh, to be up here, and I was very flattered and honored to be asked to work on the work group this year. I'm a uh, board-certified family physician. I practice in Wenatchee, Washington. For those of you who don't know, that's beyond Issaquah. <laughs> it's about <laughs> as far east as we get on our panel this morning. And although when I was growing up, Issaquah was the edge of the known universe, it's no longer felt to be that way. Um, for, I actually practice in a federally qualified health center, so in a community health center, I see several of my community health center colleagues in the audience, and I appreciate that. We do manage a very high-risk population. And because of that, we have for many years been worrying about this problem and actually have fairly sophisticated pain programs within our centers. Um, I really became worried about this where even with very sophisticated pain programs, we proved in my center that 25% of all of our mortalities. So I look at every single mortality in the 25,000 patients we care for, fully 25% of them were opioid-related overdoses in 2010. So we had to take a, a, a hard look at ourselves and what we were doing, but really it brought me to a place where I realized that even if you're doing this incredibly well, it can't be done safely. Now, there are many of you in the audience who have a different experience than that. That was my personal experience, but that experience brought me in touch with these people in the front row. It's been an honor working with them because they're way smarter than I am, and yet, they believe exactly the same things I do. So that's helpful for me. Um, so yeah, this session is to hear from primary care providers. My three colleagues here are all board certified family physicians. I'm gonna ask them to introduce themselves as they get up to speak to you. Uh, one of the participants is not with us, had a family emergency and couldn't be here today. So there are three panelists today. And I just wanna reiterate um, that throughout the process of developing these guidelines, every recommendation that was made was passed through the question of how will this play in primary care? If we choose to make this recommendation based on this evidence, what will it mean for you in primary care? And we were allowed to vociferously disagree or agree with, uh, with the recommendation. Um, so there really has been a true com commitment, I think, to primary care in the development of this uh, guideline. Um, so about half of our session is going to be our panelists asking some preloaded questions. The second half is uh, for us to answer questions which you might have filled out on the cards. If we don't have enough cards, I'm going to badger them with my difficult questions. Um, and when each of them get up, I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves in their practice, and then I'm going to ask them to describe to you as a primary care provider what do they find to be most distressing about caring for chronic pain patients and what is most satisfying in their management of chronic pain. Well, thank you, Malcolm. Um, I think um, answering the questions, I'd rather talk about what's most satisfying in uh, taking care of patients with chronic pain. <clears throat> and this is where I get to talk about my off-label use of, of drugs and um, I love coming up with creative solutions that really work for people, and I'm not going to talk in too much detail about it, but I do have a study underway right now with uh, using oral ketamine for chronic pain. <laughs> oh, there's a few people here that use it. <laughs> in uh, a randomized controlled trial, and the results will be available soon. Um, so that's definitely the most satisfying part of it. Um, the most uh, distressing part is when I learn from patients that come to me from elsewhere that sometimes people aren't listening to them and uh, not taking their concerns seriously, or at least that's what the patient is feeling. And um, it's really important for me to make sure that the patient knows that I'm listening to them. So um, my name is Lucinda Grandi. I'm one of the partners at Pioneer Family Practice in Lacey. My, uh, I have a primary care practice <clears throat> excuse me, with uh, specializations in chronic pain and addiction medicine, particularly opioid use disorder. Uh, one of my major goals in patient care is that each patient should feel special. Whether or not the patient has chronic pain is on um, chronic opioid therapy or has a substance use disorder. Um, I keep this goal in mind when I'm implementing best practices in the care of patients on chronic opioids. For example, frequent visits. These are an opportunity to reinforce and develop my relationship with a patient. This is particularly important in the care of patients with chronic pain because medical treatment options are so limited in managing chronic pain, and a respectful relationship is one of the most therapeutic tools I have. 
I use principles of motivational interviewing, and I try to call on a few of the thousands of techniques in the book by that name by Miller and Rolnick, which I highly recommend if you guys haven't read that yet. <clears throat> Regarding treatment agreements, I have a simple one-page format for clear communication with bullet points that are about three to eight words each. For example, no early refills, no giving away or selling, no replacements if lost or stolen. Everybody pretty much understands those. It takes about a minute to run through all of these points during a visit. Monitoring function. While a number score using the PEG tool can be valuable, I find that asking a specific question such as what did you do yesterday gives me a good sense of whether the patient has been lying on the couch all day or up and about cooking and cleaning or maybe even playing golf or riding their motorcycle. I document the details for comparison at later visits. Dose threshold for pain consultation. The 120 milligram morphine equivalent dose limit is helpful for giving patients some perspective on where they stand, but also if a patient is pressuring me for a higher dose, I may tell them that they are welcome to go up to a higher dose, but they'll need to get it from someone else, perhaps one of the local pain clinics. Often their relationship with me is valuable enough for them that they'll back off. How do I avoid prescribing opioids in the first place and resist pressure from patients to raise the dose? This is actually easy because I have the absolute conviction that opioids are poison. This has nothing to do with respiratory depression and overdose death. I'm talking about opioid-induced hyperalgesia, the paradoxical increase in perception of pain that occurs with exposure to opioids, particularly for prolonged periods or at high doses. In addition to the pain being intense, it begins to have a really annoying quality and has a diffuse non-anatomical distribution. And Dr. Ballantyne talked about that extensively and beautifully this morning. When I describe the syndrome to patients who are already on opioids, they recognize it immediately. And anyone who hasn't been on opioids yet will be alarmed at the prospect. So I'm gonna show you a picture of my patient Jack who is suffering from hyperalgesia. <laughs> Uh, the physiology of opioid-induced hyperalgesia has been explained by decades of animal studies. There is this concept of central sensitization where synaptic changes occur in pain pathways of the brain and spinal cord. Like radar, the brain starts picking up pain signals from everywhere in the body and amplifies them. Tragically, these changes never seem to completely go away. If you ask someone who's having a horrific time with pain after a knee surgery, you'll probably find there was some episode in the past where they had exposure to high-dose opioids, and that's what I mean by poison. So this slide shows the order in which I tend to emphasize the many adverse effects of opioids because they seem to resonate with patients in this order. Hyperalgesia, the idea of pain getting even worse, is a frightening thought to a patient with chronic pain. Patients tend to hate withdrawal symptoms and the associated craving. They also don't like the stigma and constipation or the reduced steroid hormones once that's pointed out to them. Way down at the bottom of the list of concerns to patients are the major worries that we as providers have, sedation, accidents, fractures, and of course overdose death. I think that the beautiful graph on page 12 of the revised AMDG guidelines showing the increased risk of overdose death with increased opioid doses is the single most important feature of the guidelines for medical providers. Make sure you look at page 12. But most patients on opioids don't seem to relate much to the risk of overdose death. It just seems like such a remote possibility to them. The prescription monitoring program, this is your friend. This is so valuable, I don't know how I got along without it before. I use it every time a new patient asks me for opioids, including when I'm covering for my partners and I don't know the patient. For my own patients, I use it if they ask for a refill in between visits or if there's any questionable behavior and sometimes I just check it randomly. We have an automatic prescription refill program in our clinic and the medical assistant who prepares the prescriptions will provide a prescription monitoring program report for the prescriber every three months. Communicating about aberrant behaviors. Consider Ursula, a very pleasant but anxious 58-year-old female patient I inherited on hydrocodone 35 milligrams daily for neck pain. She had frequently requested early refills. Once her back went out, once she fell and hit her head, once the pills just vanished. This history raised the specter of a mild opioid use disorder. 
Perhaps she was distressed by craving for the drug or by unsuccessful efforts to control her use or by conflict with doctors over the early refills. These are all criteria in DSM-5 for an opioid use disorder. Distress from the opioid use disorder was probably <coughs> exacerbating Ursula's pain and her anxiety. This distress was a condition as deserving of my medical attention as her pain. Fortunately, I had access to a highly effective treatment for this distress, which Dr. Saxon told us about this morning. Um, I transitioned her to buprenorphine, a pain medicine more widely known by the brand name Suboxone in its combination form with naloxone. Buprenorphine can provide enormous relief for patients with chronic pain and a comorbid opioid use disorder. In Ursula's case, I introduced the idea gently as an option at one visit and reminded her of the option at the next visit. Ten days later, she called me and said she wanted to try it. Since then, the withdrawal, craving, and much of the hyperalgesia have been erased from the equation. There have been no more freak accidents or early refill requests. Her success, like that of many other patients with similar stories, has been unbelievably satisfying for me. The new AMDG guideline recommends consideration of buprenorphine for patients with an opioid use disorder. Unfortunately, there aren't enough addiction specialists for all the patients who could benefit from this treatment. But you, as a primary care physician, can provide it for your own patients. And there is a bill winding its way through Congress to allow mid-levels to provide it, too. It was introduced about a month ago by representatives from Massachusetts and Kentucky. Uh, you, have, uh, you have to have DEA authorization, known as a Data 2000 waiver, to prescribe it. Getting this waiver is a lot less difficult than you might think. I did it myself on a Saturday online. The training itself is extremely useful, and you can find helpful, helpful resources, including mentors, at the PCSSMAT website. That's Pro Providers Clinical Support System for Medication Assisted Treatment, PCSSMAT. Right now, only 3% of primary care physicians have this waiver. But if you are prescribing opioids for chronic pain, you might consider whether some of your patients have at least a mild opioid use disorder like Ursula. I believe you will appreciate having the ability to treat them with this extremely valuable tool. Thank you. My name is Paul Williams. I'm a family doctor in Lewis County. And I want to give you a little bit of background on myself because it actually tells you why I'm here. I don't do any research. I don't do any of this other stuff. Uh, but I had a big a bullseye on my head uh, about 16 years ago. I got out of the Air Force, went to Lewis County, and um, a good number of my patients became to, came to me were chronic pain patients. And come to find out, new doctor in town, they see it in the newspaper and they come to you. And... Um, and so I had to figure out how to deal with these type of patients. And that was the most frustrating thing for me to deal with. And it's still a difficult thing in the practice. The most exciting thing has been guidelines that have come up since that time. Trying to find the information prior to that 2007 was very difficult. I'm sure many of you have been there. And so I had a really tough time trying to figure out how to protect my staff, my front office staff, who were getting frustrated by these people. Uh, um, we're just having, it would just cause chaos all the way around. And so trying to figure out how to control this aspect of my practice became a very big part of this. And then also uh, when I got another partner about four years later, actually uh, he got the big bullseye. And um, it, it was very hard for him to get rid of that bullseye. And I had to do that by putting these guidelines in our practice. So that's where I'm coming from um, of why I'm interested in this and why this is important. And this made a big difference for me. And um, the AMGA website, I poured through the 2007 guidelines and just pulled out of there whatever I could to utilize in my practice to make this easy, to make this something that I could manage and not man manage me. Um, put a pain agreement together, modified it a few times, and have my patients uh, sign it every year. Um, Re-go over the criteria that I have for them. Uh, put together, based upon the guidelines, the Global assessment, when I first come in, what questions I need to know about their pain, know about them, uh, opioid risk tool. Uh, I went ahead and pulled all those tools off and put that into the initial assessment of what, uh, when a patient came in. And then I have a two-paged ongoing pain assessment. Every time they come in, I'm sure many of you do this, uh, it incorporates what they recommended should be done on a regular basis. The CAGE questionnaire, the uh, depression questionnaire, and the MED um, 
amount. So it always brought to the forefront of my mind how, what their MUD was at that point of, of time. And with the EMR, you're able to put it in to a flow sheet, and then you could watch that over time. Um, and then, of course, the assessment of pain and function, and then the 30% reduction um, was easy because it's a 10-point scale, so if you went from a 10 to a 7, you had a 30% reduction, and that was very easy to put into clinical practice. And then uh, using the opioid pain calculator, in fact, uh, my uh, coworker, one of them, was able to put it, she made her own using a calculator, and so it's on our phone, we can do it very quickly. And probably the godson of it all was the PMP website. Um, you don't realize who's really sc scamming you. Some of them you do, but a good number of them you don't. And um, that was very, very helpful. So what we've done is we integrated this into uh, protocols, uh, office protocols, uh, rules, and everybody has to go through this. So I thought. Um, <laughs> and if you want to ask me later in the question and answer, I'll answer this. Um, but I had a, co a coworker who actually did not follow our guidelines or our rules of the office, and he got in trouble. Um, but those, you just have to assimilate the data yourself. This is great stuff to assimilate the data and to make it useful and make it flow in your practice. How do you avoid escalating doses? Um, in the past, I would just say, well, because I don't want to go up. But now I can utilize a whole bunch of stuff. Use the MED, the requirements, and the, and the risk associated with that, uh, the current laws, and um, how I can use that to back me up. Uh, talk about addiction. And uh, you know, when I first started in 2000, uh, 1999 here, the paradigm and the uh, pendulum was on the other side. Now the pendulum is back over here. And so you've had to readjust a whole bunch of things. And so, but it's allowed us to be able to talk to patients. The psychological pain issue coming from animal studies was very important for me to talk to patients about uh, and to help delve into the depression and their other um, psych issues and why they were taking the medicines when they shouldn't be and um, how that I could can tell them that your psychological pain, yes, it responds to opioids, but that's not the way to use the medication. And then talk to them what happened with other patients. So I use that to help control um, going up on the doses. Uh, the PMP, I have two clinics. Uh, one's a walk-in. Um, if someone comes up with any kind of pain, we immediately get the PMP, look at it. And just last week, I, someone came in, they had four providers, three different pharmacies up in Everett, uh, came down, and I said, you know, I'm not prescribing any narcotics to you. Just let you know before we talk. Um, and that started the conversation because I had that data to show that she was doctor shopping. But the regular clinic, we do it at least a year, every year of those red flags, which was already mentioned. Um, print it out, scan it into the chart, because that's the way we can do it right now. And if there's any irregularities, uh, I discuss it with them straight up. I like to be frank with the patients and uh, black and white. And again, we're talking about a 15-minute visit. It takes five minutes to do the prescriptions. Um, you have 10 minutes to do the rest, and there's not a lot of time there. So you want to make sure as much of it as possible is very quick and easy and routine that you don't have to think about it. Uh, the, uh, just a question about the urine drug strains. We just pick initially just a three-month period every once a year. And we'll just say, okay, these three months, everybody who comes in has to get the, UDC, you know, the urine drug test. We've had a couple people say, Time to do your urine drug test, and they walk right out. So that was easy. Um, <clears throat> they failed. Uh, so the abherent behavior, if there's any concerns about that, I go back through the pain uh, contract we have with them. I reinforce our expectations, and if they lose or accelerate or whatever, I tell them that I'm not going to um, accommodate these. And I think a lot of these people, they have a lot of mental health issues. Boundaries work. You just have to live within those boundaries yourself. Um, and then um, I let them know that withdrawal is not deadly, it's uncomfortable, it's not deadly, but these are the boundaries I expect of you. And I, in fact, they work really well with you if you give them boundaries and stay within them, they respect you as well. I guess that's I'm done. Hi, I'm Patty Reed Williams. I'm a family practice doctor and I work for the University of Washington. I am the clinic chief at the Issaquah Clinic, the neighborhood clinics. Um, I've been in practice for 27 years and worked for the university for the last 13 years. So it's um, been an interesting um, time, especially with chronic pain patients. Um, about four years ago, 
and you're going to hear a lot of the same things that you've heard from everybody else, I think, from me. About four years ago, we decided that we had a real problem in the neighborhood clinics. A lot of anxiety from providers, especially new providers and residents, because we have the whole group working in our clinics, um, over chronic pain patients. In fact, people that refuse to give anybody any opioids. Um, and then there were the other end of the spectrum, too, where they gave them to anybody that walked in the door. So we started a quality improvement project with the Center for Pain Relief uh, with Dr. Taubin and the rest of the crew there and um, tried to look at what our issues were because we knew this legislation was coming up, the 2012 guidelines, and we wanted to make sure that we could meet the letter of the law. So um, we started by developing templates in the clinic so that the providers would have a template to follow for both the first patient, the first time they saw the patient, and established patients. Um, we incorporated all the history, including asking the patient for all their previous imaging, all their previous treatment, um, any um, other issues that they'd had. We did a focused exam. We incorporated the opioid risk tool into that template, and we also incorporated the sleep apnea screen into the template because we all know that sleep is a major issue for these patients. We did put at the end of the template, because remember we have residents too, a little script about how to talk to the patient about what we were doing and how what was, the end product was going to be, including that they would either be accepted as a chronic pain patient or not accepted as a chronic patient, and they would receive a letter regarding that. We integrated um, a screening tool that the Center for Pain Relief um, put together called the Pain Tracker into our electronic medical record, and on that we have a PHQ-4, which are two questions about depression, two questions about anxiety, um, the level of pain that they have, activities that they find difficult to do, and how many days did they take more medication than they were prescribed, than they were supposed to. So that really proved to be quite useful for us because when you talk about people come in and say, I have so much more pain, and I'm like, if you can actually graph that out so that you can actually see the anxiety depression scores go up, the pain scores go up. It's very visual, very helpful for, to convince patients that we need to treat their anxiety and depression, not give them more opioids. So my manager and I put together a slideshow and went out and um, talked to all eight of the other clinics, and we came up with these must-dos. Um, the first one is making sure that they filled out all the, the smart text that we had in the smart set, if anybody knows EPIC, um, and that that would help them with the legislation and make sure that they got all the pieces put into the note that they were legally required to do. We um, asked them to do urine drug screens, and that was dependent on their opioid risk tool. The University of Washington lab medicine people were very helpful in figuring out a way of making, helping us decide which one to use and to also giving us a kind of a black and white. They're getting, there are things here that are supposed to be in their urine and there are things here that are not supposed to be in their urine. It was very clear cut. If you've ever looked at a urine drug screen, sometimes it's very difficult to figure out what is in that urine drug screen. What does that really mean? Um, we also worked on um, the controlled substance contract um, agreement is actually what we call it, and we scan that into the chart. So our patients actually do that every two years, and with the help of Deb Gordon, we got the entire system to agree on the same agreement. Um, we also put a diagnosis code in the problem list um, so that we can, whoever is covering as a provider can see that automatically. Um, we, all, we developed a little um, phrase to also put in there so that you could quickly find out what medications they were taking, what their diagnosis was, who was the prescribing provider, um, what their ORT score was, when was their last urine drug screen done, when was their last contract signed. Um, 
And we also wanted people to check the prescriber's review regularly. We initially started with our RNs doing it, but we're in the middle of patient-centered medical home, and our RNs are now doing care management, and they don't really have time to do it for us now, so we're back to doing it on our own. And hopefully we'll get the medical assistants to do it shortly. Um, we also, um, this is the controlled substance agreement that we came up with, but we also put together a policy which would help back up the providers. And our policy basically indicated that we would never give opioids on the first visit, that we, required to, we were required to do a full evaluation before we actually gave anybody any op opioids. And I can tell you that the word gets out on the street so incredibly fast. Somebody found out that I was interested in this chronic pain project and I was working on a Saturday afternoon and I had two people come in wanting um, their opioids refilled. And I said, so what is your diagnosis? They couldn't even tell me what their diagnosis was. And so it was very helpful to say, you know, we don't prescribe opioids on, our, on your first visit. We have to do a full evaluation first. So they wanted their copay back. So um. <laughs> anyway, it was, it's very helpful to have that to back you up. We also made the choice for primary care doctors to not take care of patients with a morphine equivalent dosage over 120 as a new patient. We obviously have some grandfathered patients in that are a little bit higher than that. And that, to me, is probably one of the most difficult things with taking care of chronic pain patients is trying to get their dosage to come down. Um, the um, other thing that we had in the policy was um, that we don't give refills on Friday afternoons or on the weekends over the phone. Um, our urgent care also does not refill any opioids. So anyway, I think the most, the thing that I enjoy the most about taking care of my chronic pain patients is I really know them well because I see them frequently. Um, I'm a seasoned physician, so they're complex sometimes. So they're kind of like a puzzle that we have to take apart. And we have, I, have, I feel like I have a really good relationship with them. Um, so that's how, why I'm doing what I do. So, thank you.